I'm delighted to be here, though I was slightly spooked with the first load of questions to realise the audience was estimating the speaker's BMI, and I certainly... Uh... <laughs> but Muir, I've got a pedometer on, OK? So, um, uh, seriously, I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be here. I'm really sorry I wasn't here yesterday. Uh, if anything that I do say this morning is repetitive of what was said yesterday, well, I, I have to apologise to a certain extent whilst thinking about what to say, I had to work through the issues, and you're going to see some of my working here, which feels a rather sort of uh, apposite comment in an institute of mathematics anyway. Um, as someone who spent 36 years as a, as a GP, I absolutely get and support the aspirations of this conference. And as someone who spent 65 years as a patient, mercifully not terribly often, uh, I support it even more. And as chair of NICE, uh, an organisation whose uh, point of existence is to improve the uh, quality of health and social care, I'm equally supportive. I mean, why wouldn't I be? After all, the key, the absolute key, is the word overdiagnosis. Of course I'm over, against overdiagnosis. I'm also against overcooked food, uh, overlong films, uh, over-exaggerated claims, and I have to say, wearing all my three hats, I'm equally opposed to underdiagnosis and undercooked food and so on. Um, the uh, key is to get the level of diagnosis correct. And the aim of that must be, of course, simple, to maximise benefit for patients and the public and to minimise harm. And after all, has been uh, made clear from the time of Hippocrates, a key, key duty of any doctor of our profession is to uh, first do no harm. And I've got no doubt at all that there are many activities that may be carried on with, within medicine, and we've heard about them this morning, um, where the evidence base is either non-existent or where the risk of harm greatly outweighs the risk of benefit. A very simple example is the use of uh, antibiotics for simple upper respiratory tract infections. We know we know it's ineffective, and yet still prescribing levels are high. Um, there's absolutely no evidence antibiotics are useful for common colds or coughs. There is evidence that prescribing them exposes people to risk uh, from adverse events and so on. Uh, also, uh, the whole problem of antibiotic resistance. Indeed, I sometimes suspect that clinicians actually diagnose you need antibiotics and then find a pathological diagnosis to explain why they prescribed antibiotics rather than the other way around. And uh, the key issue seems to me the really simple one of how do we get the right diagnosis in the right patient at the right time and not the wrong diagnosis in the wrong patient at the wrong time. And of course, integral to all that is the whole question of what do we mean by diagnosis? And here I suspect you talked about this a great deal yesterday, but still, for me, what is a diagnosis? What is what is a diagnosis? What are the boundaries between normal and abnormal? And who says? And we've heard in John's fabulous talk this morning about these, how do you define the definitions and, and what are your um, uh, motivations for so defining? So I know these are challenges for everyone here, and I don't think the, um, the answers are at all easy. I mean, when, when you're in doubt, you turn to the Oxford English Dictionary and the, the definition of diagnosis, this one here, well, I don't find that helps me very much at all. Um, for the simple reason, um, well, for instance, hypertension, a disease that can kill and maim, may have no symptoms whatsoever. And so logically, by that definition, you, you can't reach a diagnosis in someone who has no symptoms. But we do it all the time, hence this conference. Medicine today, I think, is dealing with two distinct populations. People who know there's something wrong with them and people who don't. And it seems to me that the whole issue of overdiagnosis can look at numerous areas. For instance, disease mongering or describing findings or behavior that could be seen as part of a normal, varied spectrum of human experience and activity, describing that as abnormal. Um, but I guess the area that interests me most uh, is the one that's frequently called medicalization. Um, and the whole question of the risks and the ethics and the benefits of finding something wrong with someone who wasn't aware they had a problem. Uh, incidentally, as this uh, couple of days is showing, uh, overdiagnosis is a huge subject and uh, I obviously need to focus. And so in much of the rest of this presentation, uh, I'm going to concentrate on an issue that absolutely highlights the tensions. And I also know that if I don't talk about statins, you won't let me get out of here alive. Um, so I might as well bite the bullet and uh, use as an exemplar 
of some issues that I think are important, uh, and also to demonstrate my own inherent masochism. Um, so, uh, NICE, as you know, produced uh, an updated guidance on the prevention of cardiovascular disease in uh, July this year. In all our areas of work, uh, which now spread, the, 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 the realm of NICE uh, spreads from dealing with the ultra-rare diseases and ultra-rare dr drugs needed for those ultra-rare diseases, all the way through quality standards, quality uh, guidelines, the work that, that was referred to earlier, uh, through public health work, uh, now right into social care, the quality of social care. So we're, we're really dealing with from almost the molecular to the multinational, from, from orphan drugs to kindness in care homes. And it's, it's an extraordinary breadth. And it feels to me we have to have just a single way of working to try and tie all those together. Uh, and the core principles of everything we do are, are these. Um, using evidence, uh, expert input, involving patients and carers in every single piece of work that, uh, that we do. Uh, independent, independent committees, really important. And I do understand controversy around this, but, but that, that really is important. Genuine consultation, everything going out for consultation. Uh, regular review, an open process to be as transparent as possible. Part of the reason I, I, I can't stay for the rest of today, we've got a board meeting in Kendall tomorrow, uh, starting um, part of the meeting tonight. Most of our, all our board meetings are held, uh, you know, the public board meetings are genuinely in public. Sometimes up to 90 members of the public come along and attend and ask questions and so on. It's a, a very transparent process. Uh, and also taking really on board social values and equity uh, considerations. Uh, and as I say, our committees, our independent committees, um, always include patients and the public and follow extremely strict criteria to try and ensure that conflicts of interest are identified and declared and dealt with accordingly. And if someone has uh, conflicts of interest which we believe would be damaging to the work, we exclude them from continuing the discussion. And it's really important to me that we are dealing with science here, not theology. An awful lot of the debate around statins seems to me to have focused on whether people believe in statins or not. Um, NICE were early signatories to the alltrials.net uh, campaign. There is absolutely no reason for us not to want to get the right answer. And indeed, in any aspect of work that we do, if the science is wrong, NICE will change. Uh, we'll change our advice, um, debate, discussion, revision. That's what science is. But this isn't the place, please, to debate the science. There's quite enough to focus on today around the whole issue of overdiagnosis. So perhaps when we get to the Q&A, can we not sort of go back over and over the science of, of statins and cardiovascular disease? Fascinating though it is, because what I'm really interested in in this, in this session is, assuming as most clinicians do, that certain, uh, treating certain levels of CVD risk is of benefit, what are the implications of this, philosophically, ethically, practically? And I do want to be absolutely clear, and I said this to the House of Commons Health Select Committee a couple of weeks ago, absolutely clear, I do not want medicalization of great swathes of the population, as some have accused us of. This is not what NICE is advocating either. We're really clear about issues like uh, exercise, diet, and so on. But when it came to the specific question around uh, the threshold for statins, uh, the question we were addressing related to cost effectiveness. The price of statins, because they'd become pretty well totally generic, had fallen dramatically. And as a result, the point at which they became cost effective changed. Uh, that's it. But this is not, absolutely not, an instruction to give everyone pills. Personally, I have no desire for the prescription of statins to be part of the quaff, and I absolutely get uh, the issues in this country and probably around the world about the current uh, workload in general practice. But there's an interesting and complex issue here for me. Many of the issues around statins uh, are very similar to issues around hypertension. In both of them, you've got a population of people who feel perfectly well, who are told they're at risk of becoming ill. Now, because GPs and their teams are busy, should we be changing the thresholds for treatment of hypertension for that, for that reason? Should we start to say, uh, your doctor's busy, so for the next few months, we're going to shift the threshold to 170 over 110? I mean, we could do that. Would that be good science? Would it be doable? 
we could ignore, ignore a lot of the issues around preventing CVD. It would certainly make an awful lot of people's lives easier. Uh, it would certainly minimise overdiagnosis. But if, as NICE's experts uh, agree, statins do approve risk in appropriate patients, what's the difference? What's the difference philosophically between advising treatment for cholesterol and treatment for high blood pressure? Um, most patients with high blood pressure are totally asymptomatic. Is diagnosing hypertension an act of overdiagnosis? I absolutely accept, we all know, that most patients treated with hypertensive agents will get absolutely no benefit. Retrospectively, they may be said to have been overdiagnosed. Prospectively, is quite another matter. After all, we've got good evidence that high blood pressure is bad for health. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm not talking about the very mild to moderate levels, but the high blood pressure is bad for health, and that treating it makes a significant difference. A difference to angina, peripheral vascular disease, heart attack, heart failure, stroke to name a few. A couple of graphs here from the British Heart Foundation. The first graph shows the increase uh, in prescription of antihypertensive drugs, antiplatelets, antiarrhythmics, and lipid lowers, lowers since 1981. Uh, and the second graph shows a corresponding decrease in CVD uh, death rates, a major public health triumph. And I'm very aware that most of this benefit came from beginning to address issues around smoking in 1962. I have also seen the websites that show you graphs like this, which correlate the number of polar bears in the Arctic with swimming pools in Idaho. Um, but I think most, most clinicians would agree that there has, been, there has been a link here. It's a real, you could say, a real public health triumph. So given a patient with a blood pressure of 168 over 95, what do you do? Is telling them that they have uh, raised blood pressure an example of overdiagnosis? As I've said, treatment will, for almost for any individual, be unlikely to do any good. So are we wrong to know? Are we wrong to tell them? And if we don't, what's the alternative? You can't unknow something about someone. And how do we handle the conundrum uh, that if we either don't find out or choose not to tell someone about their raised blood pressure, we condemn many people to strokes, to heart attacks, to early death. We condemn other innocent people to losing spouses, bereavement, having no father, having no wife, no partner, no lover, to pain, to sorrow, to loss. How do we address that? Professor Sir John Took, the president of the Academy of Medical Sciences, uh, has said, and I quote, few would deny the treatment of hypertension, uh, a largely symptomless condition, on the grounds that it was medicalizing the recipient. Uh, despite the fact that lifestyle influences blood pressure. If treatment of higher levels of blood pressure to diminish stroke and attack is acceptable, so too is the treatment of high cholesterol above an evidence-based threshold. And he went on, the weight of evidence suggests statins are effective, affordable, and have an acceptable risk-benefit profile. Appropriate drug therapy should not be denied on the basis of an ideological stance against medicalization. Well, the real complexity of this, of course, lies the, the simple fact that most people, well, few people, we all enthuse about prevention, but we rarely get excited about it because we can never see the results. It's really gratifying and exciting to meet someone uh, who's uh, the, 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 that Premier, Premier League footballer who collapsed on the pitch and was resuscitated Fantastic story, wonderful story. It's amazing to meet people who've had heart attacks, been treated dramatically, done wonderfully well. The whole healthcare and social care system has really looked after them. But actually, infinitely preferable for every single person in here is not having a heart attack. The trouble is, even the person who doesn't have the heart attack doesn't know they haven't had a heart attack. There isn't any story, there is no glamour, there's nothing, but I do not think there is a soul in here who would rather have a heart attack treated well than avoid having a heart attack. It's really, really tricky. There's no glamour, as I say, and I suspect that in my 36 years as a, as a GP, the most useful things I did resulted in nothing happening. It's a bit of a boring story, but... Uh, um, so the excitement of the dramatic life-saving intervention, those are the bits we all remember, the, the stories I can tell. But actually, from, a, from a, a patient perspective, it was the prevention that did it, but it was just pretty dull. 
I find this a really fascinating issue. But I hope that ethical questions like this will become uh, easier to unravel in the coming years. Um, I've got little doubt that uh, many of the answers to, to this uh, blood pressure and statins and so on will lie in improved risk stratification, maybe from the new genomics, uh, maybe from clues that we never recognized from analyzing big data, but we are where we are. So I guess the question lies in, uh, at the moment lies in, how do we apply first do no harm to populations? How much disease and disability in a few individuals justifies how much treatment is needed unnecessarily by others? Is avoiding a massive stroke in Mrs. Smith justified by treating 76 of her fellow citizens as well unnecessarily? And until we understand the best ways to focus the science on individuals, rather than populations, then ultimately, I believe, the answer must lie in individuals making far more of that decision for themselves. Um, if I could go back. I can't go back, so forget that. Um, this absolutely means that doctors need access to the data, the evidence, and that they know and understand the recommendations. It means that doctors need time absolutely critical, need time to explore individual patients' health beliefs, uh, ideally using risk management tools to explain risk. And I'm, I'm delighted to say uh, that NICE is well on course with developing a, a patient decision aid uh, on statins for primary for prevention. We've got an expert um, steering group meeting early next month. We hope to be able to pu publish the aid at the beginning of November. I would have really wished that we could have published it at the same time as the, uh, as the, the uh, publication in July. Um, but we did do, we were just, there was too much too much to do, too little time, something everyone in this room completely understands. But we have published one. This one on the screen here uh, is a, a screenshot from a uh, guideline or advice for patients around uh, atrial fibrillation and the use of anticoagulation. Um, so these are the sort of graphics that are, that are being used in NICE's products for patients to help patients uh, and their clinicians come uh, to the right decision about what to do. This graphic shows the risk of uh, atrial fibrillation-related ischemic stroke over one year in a group of 1,000 people with AF and a score of two on this wonderfully acronymic score here. Um, and then we show subsequent graphics showing the impact of different interventions. But even before we had these aids available, it's important to note that we have patients and public involved in the production of the guidance and that we do produce information for the public uh, accompanying all our guidance. And for instance, in the, the patient guide to statins that's already published, we offer prompts for patients, uh, for questions people might wish to ask their doctor. For instance, how will the treatment, I mean, obvious questions, how will the treatment help me? Uh, how, will it, how much will it reduce my risk? And we also absolutely stress in our guidance uh, to healthcare professionals on communicating risk and benefit with uh, with patients, we do focus on this, but I do think it's something we can do and need to do much more to share this decision-making process. And then once <coughs> patients have made decisions, it also means supporting them in the decisions they make. And all this requires discussion before a test is carried out as to whether a test needs to be carried out. And I'm very aware that that isn't always possible. There are emergency situations, and there are also situations when a test carried out for one reason discloses something else you weren't quite expecting. But I'm really, really clear of one important issue. NICE guidelines are just that. There is a clue in the word guideline. Guidelines, not tramlines. The issue is frequently not so much about overdiagnosis, though that absolutely does occur, it's much more that there's over-treatment of diagnoses that are clinically irrelevant. Over-treatment bothers me a great deal. The skill, the duty of a doctor is to make sensible prescribing decisions, one of the skills, one of the duties of a doctor, sensible prescribing decisions in patients' interests, not to start people on treatments because the guidelines say you have to, they don't. Every single guideline from NICE has the phrase, Treatment and care should take into account individual needs and preferences. Patients should have the opportunity to make informed decisions about their care and treatment in partnership with their health care professionals. So as far as I'm concerned, it's bad medicine to say your age is X, your cholesterol is Y, 
Nice says you must take a statin. That is not what we say. That is not what you or I would want. That isn't patient-centred care. Um, as Al Mully and colleagues uh, in a paper for the King's Fund published recently have argued, if you don't elicit patient preferences, you risk treating the wrong thing. And it strikes me that in transactional analysis terms, um, it's the doctor-patient relationship being a parent-child relationship, when we should always be aiming for that adult-adult relationship. So when we uh, look at our mantra of the right diagnosis, right patient at the right time, this immediately begs all sorts of questions, as I said, about the word diagnosis. Is a raised cholesterol an, in or an increased risk of cardiovascular disease a diagnosis? Or is it just information? So when does information become a diagnosis? Being diagnosed with cancer is clearly a diagnosis. Being diagnosed with a raised cholesterol is just being told you have a risk factor. So how can we then avoid the fact that for some people, even discussing the fact that they may or may not have a risk factor becomes a worrying act with ad potential adverse effects. <coughs> After all, um, we want to avoid overdiagnosis. Everyone here does. I'm equally sure we don't want doctors to stop providing information. That would be paternalistic in the extreme. That would be parent-child taken to the limit. So maybe the whole language of overdiagnosis is somehow symbolic of our approach to finding and sharing information with patients. Maybe it's that that needs to change. <coughs> Discuss. You have three hours, one side of the paper only. Um, the, the, the other vital key is ensuring we use the right diagnosis, uh, in ensuring we reach the right diagnosis and the right patient at the right time, involves the appropriate use of investigation the right investigations at the right patient at the right time. Um, following Rustam's wonderful uh, talk on brain scans, can I tell you an evidence-free anecdote? Many years ago, I had a, a registrar working in my practice who'd been a hospital doctor, I think, for about 12 years and had switched to uh, general practice. And he sat in with me for a, his first surgery. And at the end of it, I turned to him and I said, so how was that then? And he, he looked at me and he said, David, I have no idea how you dare practice like that. Which did make me sort of take a slight indrawing of breath. And he said, no, 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 you misunderstand me. That wasn't a criticism. It was a compliment. You saw a patient today with a headache and you didn't arrange a scan. I've never met a doctor who didn't arrange a scan for someone with a headache. And this is because of of course, GPs and specialists are working with different populations. And this comes back to, the, to Rustam's talk about the, uh, the, the choice for scans. This wonderful quote from Marshall Marinka in 1994, specialists aim to reduce uncertainty, explore possibility, and marginalize error. The generalist aims to accept uncertainty, explore probability, and marginalize danger. It's because we're dealing with population, different populations. Iona Heath has lectured about this beautifully as well. Fundamentally different populations. And so it's, for me, fundamental that our evolving health services continue to recognize this fundamental difference between primary and secondary care, that each depends on the other, and that to support primary care with its remarkable effect, uh, I think I, I've described it uh, in this paper as a, a the risk sink, uh, that primary care can absorb a lot of risk and uncertainty without unnecessary investigation. And this is a vitally important way in which we can ensure that investigations and their sequelae appropriately targeted. And it's such an important topic. Indeed, in my 20 minutes, I'm, I'm very aware I haven't gone anywhere near mental health. Um, I'm, indeed, I haven't even unpicked whether we really do believe that prevention is better than cure. But I'm sure we can completely agree that it's the patient who has to come first and that you can have too much medicine and that you can certainly have too much of a good thing. The question remains, of course, how much is that? Thank you.
Um, I can't even remember which order they came, but one <laughs> screen. Right. Uh, uh, NHS, uh, the, the NHS health check is not, and the whole of screening is not part of NICE's remit. So that's number one. Yes, I know, but you're in an ideal position to comment on it, aren't you? Indeed, okay. and I do. Okay. And I do. Num number two, the whole issue around general practice, income, workload, and so on. I'm a former both chairman and president of the RCGP. Uh, spend an awful lot of time on this, and it's not really appropriate for me to be talking about funding levels and so on. My, the role, NICE's role in the COF is absolutely to provide uh, a menu of m things that there is an evidence base for where there are metrics that can be used to measure differences. We then pass that over to NHS England and the G General Practitioners Committee of the BMA to do the negotiation around what goes in. Our role is purely, purely, purely scientific. We do not, and I will not, get involved. If, if our role was, was a diff if the question NICE was set was a different question, come up with a methodology for measuring the quality of care in general practice, then that's a completely different question, which we would look at in a completely different way. The, the thing about the, the graph, I acknowledged, first of all, the public health issues, the reduction of smoking. I did not say it was lipid lowering. I said it's a, most doctors would agree that it's a combination of public health measures and antihypertensives and all the other therapies, of which this is one. What I'm saying is we have got a dramatic reduction in cardiovascular disease, but we still have one in three people dying from this. Um, but, I, but listen, I threw out a bunch of questions there saying this is difficult. Uh, I'm not assertively saying uh, go out unto all the world and check everybody's cholesterol. I'm absolutely not saying that. At the back there, could you just one question, if you don't mind? I, I'm, I think that we, need, we need absolutely the best possible evidence to base everything on. I have been, um, again, Health Select Committee two weeks ago stressed that I could see no moral justification for any trial data being withheld, that it's critical that we have it all. Uh, we're in a lot of discussion around this. I've been in, in, I, 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 in terms of getting data, it's critical. In terms of getting the endpoints, well, the tricky thing about a lot of, of outcome measures is with this sort of area, we're dealing about things way into the future. So what we try and do, try and do, is get a combination of experts, generalists, patients, put it out to consultation. Uh, again, reminding you, it's not actually NICE that does the work around, for instance, guidance. It is uh, committees that are recruited by the collaborating centres based in the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Obstetricians, Gynaecologists, and so on. Um, so uh, recruiting this group of people to try and get the best possible evidence that we can, deal with the conflicts of interest. Uh, I want all data in the public domain, absolutely. There's no excuse for that. But in terms of waiting 10 years for an outcome, yeah, I can absolutely understand in retrospect that's the right thing to have done. In prospect, it's quite tricky. It's tricky. If you don't want, I mean, uh, if you all thought of nobody, I'm going to take five minutes of your coffee time, if that's all right. Is uh, there, is, there is a well-known thing. NICE is working on a moment called the caffeine deficiency syndrome, which uh, <laughs> I just want to be... There's a lot of people seeing you at the moment. They're going to go right to the back there, and then I'm going to come here, John. Right back there, and you're going to come here, John. I've got a proposal to make from NHS Choices. Now, there's still lots of problems with the content of NHS Choices, health checks, for example, as Margaret has brought up. But we have to trust the citizen. 
there's not time for clinicians to do this, and many clinicians do not have the skill, um, as Gert Gigerentzer and Alma have shown. Uh, Lisa Swartz and Steve have shown the, the education level is not necessarily a problem in communicating clearly. So my proposal, made briefly to Fiona, is that uh, we devote one day of the Evidence Live conference next year to giving the citizens the information. <coughs> Uh, nice, I'm sure, would join Absolutely. us in uh, helping sponsor and arrange that day. I know you'll have many demands at the time, but we have to. We, at the moment, we send out 1.5 billion letters, 1 billion lab reports, and 1 billion prescriptions, and I've rarely seen any with useful information in them. There's no link to the to Nice. Why is it? Someone, a woman, said to me, "My hairdresser sends me information online and not the health service." I said, "Oh, that's easy." Hairdresser's been to university for five years and then six years of postgraduate training. That must be why hairdressers do it. We've got to get a grip of the knowledge and trust the citizens. So my proposal is to the organisers of Evidence Live, we make this a major theme um, of the conference in March next year. I absolutely agree. The, the line I use over and over again is whose body is it anyway? Well, absolutely, John. I agree with every word of that, and, and hence my, you know, going back to the old transactional analysis, adult adult model. That, that it is vital that we have both the the mindset, the mindset to to make sure that patients are in a position to understand this, and the tools. For instance, the the visualization tools that help patients make this decision. Also, at the nice conference this year. Uh, I don't know if Julian Treadwell's here, but we did a, 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 a wonderful presentation uh, around the whole issue, which really bothers me big time as well, of, of uh, multimorbidity and the complex, complex impact of multimorbidity on overtreatment, overdiagnosis, uh, and gave our audience similar size to this voting pads as to what, what benefits this audience of nice conference attendees thought individual drugs were bringing to a particular patient. And then when we showed them what the actual benefits were to that individual patient, did they want to continue with the treatment? And the vast majority stopped almost all the treatments. So, so we're really into an interesting territory here uh, that I, I cannot tell you enough, NICE and I are really committed to getting real world information for real people, which I suspect will lead to a lot less medicine. One last question.
the original group of head, essentially, the side effects of that was all trial, the very bad measure, the very bad measure, almost all trials are under the final team of the city community. CPT, we hear an option of having secrecy agreement which is not by God, the nature of the data or the injury of the patient data. I want to ask you what power does NICE have to get hold of these data before you offer guidance? What we... Clem, I, I, you know I absolutely support the need to get hold of the data. What we are doing, the chief thing we're doing at the moment is asking the medical directors, the UK medical directors of pharmaceutical companies, to sign that we have been provided with all the information on that particular drug. Now, the reason for asking the medical director to do it is their job is on, their, their pro professional life is on the line if they lie to us. So it, we're doing everything we can. We also want, need, need to work very closely with the MHRA to make sure we get all the data. There is no excuse not to have all the data. And the only other thing I would say about statins and side effects, and I, I totally understand where you're coming from, is that most mornings I get out of bed aching like anything, and I turn to my wife and say, if, if I was on statins, I'd be stopping them now. Um, <laughs> on that point, on that point, um, <laughs> I, I want to thank David and say uh, what a great session and enjoy talking with you.